Hi guys, welcome, Diana Manowska, Family Law Attorney. Today I would like to talk about domestic violence restraining orders and I feel like um, there are phases where there is a bunch of prenuptial uh, clients, usually in summertime, and then there is a phase where kids go to school, August, September, and then right before holidays, I get the face of domestic violence restraining order clients. And so lately I have this face of domestic violence restraining order clients. And I noticed 2022 common theme is um, not physical abuse, more stalking, um, disturbance of peace, name calling, fights, and this is really, it's, it's, a, it's a very sensitive topic because usually things of this nature happen in closed doors and closed rooms and people, um, you know, they, re they record the conversation when they don't know whether or not they, they're allowed to record. And so I wanna shine light a little bit in, into this domestic violence restraining order world so, for example, if um, you record someone, the law states, if you record someone in bedroom, then without other person's consent, it's a violating penal code section and is a misdemeanor. However, there is an exception if you record in expectation that something will happen. For example, you know, husband uh, comes home, you know, cliche drinks and beats me up. I know around six time he's going to have his second shot of vodka and he's going to beat me up or say something. And so I record secretly. No, now what, what happens if I record not so secretly, if I stand in front of him and say, I am recording you now, um, is it okay? Well, technically no, because he has to give me consent. And if he if he still behaves the way he behaves and sees that I'm him recording him, then it could be construed consent by implication, meaning he sees that I'm recording and he doesn't say stop recording. Um, that would be obvious if he said that. So that's one uh, issue that comes up a lot about recording in private area. So anything outside of private area, for example, on the street or um, in, in exchange locations, police station, that's considered a public area. Therefore, it's there is no expectation of privacy. So what else? People, when they uh, file restraining orders, usually they want the other side to stay away. That's the whole reason, right? Why not? And sometimes it's, it's filed as tactical reasons. And I have a lot of videos about how to file a restraining order, what to do. But today, I just want to touch base about uh, really misusing domestic violence as a tool to get um, advantages. So, for example, one advantage is, you know, I, I am really spiteful person and I'm going to file a restraining order so that you and your parents who are just visiting from another country have to live on the street so you feel the pain of, you know, me being the boss or doing what I say. And it's not about really being a, a victim of domestic abuse. Um, so if someone is really is afraid of someone, when that happens in the moment, I suggest to call police. And um, otherwise it looks fishy. For example, if I have a situation where I'm being abused and I come back to my abuser and with, with all these things and psychologists might disagree because they will think that, you know, victims usually try to protect their abusers and they have all these syndromes, Stockholm or whatever. They, they have these reasons why they're not calling police, but I am as a lawyer, when I go to court and I present this case, it just doesn't sit well when special the victim is, let's say, um, it doesn't matter, male or female, um, 
just sits on it for so long. And then when divorce starts to, to become the only solution, then they file to and ask to move out. It just, it just doesn't, it, and again, it's not, it's not about this one thing. It's about factors that accumulate over time. For example, um, uh, mood swings, right? The person could have mood swings today. That person is great. Tomorrow they, they start being abusive and then they file their domestic violence restraining order. How, how do you deal with these kind of people? Um, I think once you feel that there is some kind of shitty dynamic is happening, call a lawyer, call me, get legal um, sensitivity of what um, what the options are and what I need to present this court with as much genuine uh, reasoning as possible. So the biggest challenge I have recently is when cases happen in these closed doors and I have a sense that the other side, you know, filed a restraining order against the spouse number one and now this is spouse number two and conspire, so to say, to get them out of their, you know, just get them out in most painful way and it's hard to prove. Right. So technically a person who is sort of credible, um, making these actions by living in a shelter and basically when they create this type of, um, and, and it could be a very nice shelter, better than the living situation they have right now and creates these, um, allegations that happen in a closed door, this is it. So. If I were in a situation where I have a feeling that the other side could fabricate, I would be out and would not uh, be in touch with them in person, only via safe texting, you know, a different apps. There's uh, my family wizard app that costs money and the free app, talking parent app. So that helps to navigate the custody situation. So it's, if I'm living with a person who I know is very provocative and trying to get me to, you know, to get a reaction out of me, I would not give it to them. And instead I would just separate myself. So that's the best advice I can give in terms of, and it's really tough to do because you're living in it and it's kind of the toxic dynamic and it's hard to comprehend it right now, but the end result, if that person says something you did that you didn't do, and it's, he said, she said, it's, it's, it, it comes down to credibility. And, um, you know, it's, nobody has a lie detector when, when a person testifies, it just comes to the gut feeling and, you know, inconsistent statements. And it's just, it's too easy to make it up. So be careful that's in custody. If, if you are in the position where you have to move yourself out and that other spouse is staying in this place, do the right thing, pay child support, spouse support, do everything to take care of that person, but also preserving your sanity. Because if that person files restraining order, you will lose custody for a long time. And there will be emergency screening and things like that. Uh, an emergency screening, for example, is a court appointed uh, therapist or a mediator, for, uh, could be social worker, who will speak to the child or children directly and establish their credibility. And there is no, I mean, children also can, can tell stories. So I'm not saying that the domestic violence restraining orders is, is, is not real. Kind of know when it's real and when it's not, when you talk to a person, but it's, it's really becoming very much um, a power tool in, in the divorce proceeding. So, all right, custody and getting this person out. So let's say if I get this 
case where the other person is kicked out and then I get an email saying, well, you know, let's negotiate. Then it tells me it's another, it's an, it's another indicator that the other side doesn't really mean it because when they file a restraining order and I ask for a continuance and they say, well, let's set it for a status conference date and resolve it. The problem with that is that status quo, meaning whatever is happening right now is gonna remain. So if my client is the one who is kicked out and the other side is saying, well, let's um, l let's talk it out, then what I do know is that they're going to use restraining order as a leveraging tool to get my client to agree to less favorable terms. That's blackmail. That's not okay. So if, if, uh, if the other side knows how tough it is to fight a restraining order because the burden of proof they have is by, they have to prove that domestic violence occurred by preponderance of evidence, which means more likely than not than what he or she is saying is correct. It's, it's relatively easy to do unless, unless that person is completely, you know, in, not credible when they, they get confused in their own story or we catch them in the lie. Like I had in one case where the person was claiming that the other abuser, alleged abuser, hit um, that person in their head. And the, the client, the alleged abuser said, well, that was actually when we were hiking in that place. And the victim says, no, I was never hiking in that place and I never hit my head there. And then we, we take a break. And then we show pictures of, of that place, of, of being there, you know, you have location and all of that. Oh yeah, uh, I was in that place, you know, come on. So that's, that's a very kind of fabricated and those cases were, where I had those two. Um, I lost my train of thought. So anything you text to the other side is going to be potentially used in court. So text messages, phone logs, uh, emails, any communication, Instagram, Facebook, any, any communication will be potentially used. So make sure be to be careful what you write and what you text. And even, even recording and <clears throat> coming to a person and allegedly being a victim and trying to harass them with a recording can be also construed as um, as an act of disturbance of peace. So even though you feel like, okay, now I can record. Now I expect them to be the abuser. I'm going to stand in front of them and record them just in case. Well, <laughs> it can go either way. So it's not that uh, black and white. And so in that case that I just remembered that I talked about where the other side is saying, let's negotiate. I'm not going to negotiate with someone when they're trying to leverage domestic violence restraining order. I have been on the other side where um, I had to, I had to um, make sure that I don't combine um, financial issues and domestic violence restraining orders and custody. And it's sometimes really tough because custody and restraining orders are going hand in hand because part of the restraining order, once it's granted, is sole legal and physical custody to the alleged victim. And the alleged abuser will have to go and do whatever it takes, including 52 weeks of better intervention program, 12 weeks of anger management, whatever the court is going to order once it's done. And then usually no less than one year, it can come back and ask for joint legal and physical custody. So that's um, something to keep in mind that it's once it's granted, it's, it's, it's a long way to get back on visitations, on increased time, on 
on all of that um, to, to get back on track. And once, let's say you don't have money to fight and you say, okay, I am going to agree to these allegations because I don't have 55, 25 to whatever thousand dollars to pay for the attorney's fees and the court grants supervised visitation, it can take a year or more to lift the supervised visitation because the hearing can get continued. The, the other side might say, you know, on that supervised visitation, you, 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 you did something I, I didn't approve you. You gave a, a different bananas than whatever. I mean, they, they can, it's not enough, right? So the the whole point of supervised visitation is that the supervisor sup oversees the um, the visitation and then drafts the report that can be presented to court and the judge will decide, okay, based on this one year of supervision, I can tell that this person is ready to have unsupervised visitation. Um, it's, it's difficult when supervision happens in rally and if the child speaks different than English language. So in rally, it's, it's, it's a very dark place. It's, I don't recommend, uh, I mean, people sometimes don't have money and they have to go through rally. It takes two weeks to schedule the meeting and they only have limited availability and it's only in one room, no food, only speaking English kind of thing. And what are you going to do with your child if 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 you can't speak anything else but other, other than English but you are used to speak you know Russian or whatever language it's it's really tough so i admire people who have you know been through that and and went through supervised visitation didn't give up um and did all the classes and came back and fight for for being um parent in in their child's life so that's i think i think i covered most of my um concerns and ideas i have for this month uh, or for this last couple of weeks that are going through my head that i wanted to share with you if you have any comments um ask them in the comment section. And if you need a consultation with me, just uh, go to my website and schedule online. And, um, or you can just call me or text me to the phone number on my website, or I can give it to you right now, 415-347-0584. All right, I will see you soon, bye.